So I recently um, published some sketches from my uh, from the trip to Tanzania, and there's one where there's some clouds in the background, and I saw a comment from uh, somebody who said like, "Ooh, I like those clouds. I wonder how you're doing that." So, and I thought to myself, you know what? That happened pretty easily. Um, I remember watching it kind of happen in front of me with my brush, and I went like, "Oh, that's all I need to do." <laughs> and and it was it was it was simple. It was fun, and they looked like clouds, and they looked like the clouds I was looking at. And so I thought I would just do a little workshop to show that technique. Let me show you. Let me show you the those clouds how they looked. This is the the sketch that started this conversation. Okay, there you are. And it's not too big a journal. You think you'd be able to flip to it. Um, and uh, the, so the paints I'm going to be working with today are uh, watercolor and gouache. And watercolor you're familiar with. Gouache is a paint that works very much like watercolor, except it's more opaque. And so that means that when you put it down, uh, if you're using gray toned paper, um, if you're doing watercolor, which is transparent, you see the gray of the paper through the color. So if I wanted something to say be bright white or light blue, you would be kind of dulled down by that gray of the paper. So if you use the gouache paint, then that's not a problem. Um, the gouache sits on top of your, um, your, your paper and kind of makes a, makes a barrier. And where did that picture go? Oh, there it is. Ah. All right. Um, here we are. I'm going to bounce over to, and so I'm going to be using some gray toned paper here. And I lost my page again. Uh, there we are. Nope. Uh, Uh, we've got a question about what kind of journal with the gray paper you're using. Ah, so this is a Strathmore toned paper journal. And here's here's the here's the cloudscape that uh, kind of started all this business. So this is a Strathmore toned paper journal, and I've got a little heart of beast over here, kind of looking out across the termite mounds and hoping that there are no lions hiding anywhere out here. Here's some storks, storks circling around. This is kind of cool. How can you tell that there's storks? Because it says circling storks and has a lion pointed to it. So that is written notes working for me. And, um, uh, but um, this little cloudscape here came out pretty quickly and easily. And um, that made me happy. And so what I wanted to do is sort of show kind of how I did that and a little bit of more thinking about um, drawing different types of clouds with, uh, with, with the system, with gouache and toned paper. So if we look here, you can see that there is some kind of light blue here, the little bit of variation in the blue here there's some purples kind of coming into that here as we get towards the horizon things are kind of getting more dull in the sky it's gray down here and there's a little bit of brown you can see some brown color kind of coming through here um and then i have we can see that there's some layers of cumulus clouds back there some of these sort of puffy shapes with the sunlight hitting the top edges of those and lighting them up. So um, if I flip through this book, there's a few other kind of cloudscapes. And let's just take a look at a few of those. Here's one with, or, or skyscapes. Here's one without any clouds. Generally, when you look towards the horizon, the sky gets paler blue. And right along the horizon, there's often a little bit of kind of a warm brown that you're seeing. Um, 
So the sky itself changes color. And uh, I think that'll do for, for now. Oh, here's just another little kind of quick landscape. Uh, we notice that we're kind of getting paler towards the horizon. There's a few little um, eland walking around. They're really big antelope. They're walking around in a little group. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Little, oh, there we go. There's our eland pile. So what's happening with this? Um, I am, let's first take a, a, a look at, there we go. First, let's take a look at how to, one moment, I am, this is me. This is me resizing my screen. There we are. And let's change that over to There we are. Um, so on the left hand side of our screen, uh, we have a um, hi, video panel. Um, uh, I've got a little chart of a number of types of clouds. And I think this is kind of a good way to start thinking about clouds because um, there we are. Um, so yeah, let's let's think about these these different types of clouds. Clouds are classified by shape and height. So basically, if you have a puffy cloud, we're going to call those cumulus clouds. And you can have um, big puffy clouds, medium-sized puffy clouds, which start to kind of get in lines, and then very high puffy clouds. So those are the puffy clouds. And we generally call puffy cloud clouds cumulus clouds. So. Um, the other big shape that we see is sort of sheets of clouds. So if there's sort of a gray, just sort of total sheet of clouds over your head and they're not making cool, like, you know, sheep shapes, um, we call those stratus clouds. And so the stratus clouds can be low, they can be mid-level, and the stratus clouds can be high. Um, so shape is one thing, whether it's sheets, or puffy. And then the other little piece of this is that um, the we have the, the height of the cloud. So you see here high, mid, and low. So for the low ones, the puffy clouds are called cumulus clouds. The low clouds are called stratus clouds. All of this sort of uh, cumulus label is going to carry throughout all the different elevations, but they're going to put a prefix on it. So when they get a little bit higher, they're called alto cumulus. And when they're super high, so much that they're high up, so high up that they're frozen, these are called cirrocumulus. So cumulus, alto cumulus, cirrocumulus. And the same is true with stratus, stratus clouds. So stratus clouds, if you have the sheets of gray clouds down low, you've got stratus clouds, mid-level, alto, again, alto, alto, stratus. The really high ones, these sheets of clouds, those are cirrostratus. And um, you can tell you've got alto stratus clouds because it kind of looks like you're you're looking through kind of a sheet of ground glass when you're looking at the sun. And it'll just sort of be a little bit hazy. But if you're looking at uh, clouds that are high enough that they are frozen, they're frozen up there. Actually, I can make this a little bit bigger. There we are, frozen. Um, then the frozen ice crystals cause really cool reactions with the sun. You get 
these rings around the sun. You can also get sun dogs, um, which are little rainbow spots on either side of the sun, 22 degrees away from the sun. And that is, um, so those are the stratus, alto stratus, zero stratus, cumulus, alto cumulus, zero cumulus. So re remembering that, that sort of, sort of simple name, alto zero, and then the stratus and the, 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 the cumulus clouds, you now have six cloud types that you already know. Um, there's just a couple other ones that, um, that we're gonna add into this. If the, um, a, in addition to the high elevation clouds just being um, in little kind of puffy rows, if they are in wispy strands, those are just called cirrus clouds. So the term cirrus clouds just refers to the high clouds that are not in little puffy rows, that are not just like a sheet, but they're kind of looking like horsetails. So add cirrus to your bucket. And one other little cloud type that is fun to have um, is the, um, the uh, uh, stratus clouds, if they're raining on you, then they put the prefix nimbo, meaning rain, in front of it. And um, so we've got nimbo stratus clouds if it's raining on you. So anytime it's raining, you can walk outside and say, why? Look at, look at those, uh, those nimbo stratus clouds. I'm wet. So there's a little bit of just sort of the, the cloud types. It's fun to identify cloud types. And one reason that it's fun is it gets you to look a little bit more closely at them. So if I'm looking out my window right now, I'm seeing some alto stratus clouds to the west and the rest of my sky is clear. So I'm down here, I've got some alto stratus clouds. If you've got uh, a window adjacent to you right now. I want to encourage you to look out your window, notice your cloud types. Oh, and I have some just zero stratus clouds out there. So I've got alto stratus and zero stratus clouds um, outside my house. What do you have in your part of the woods? Drop us a note in the chat. Now, supposing we want to draw these. All right, let's just take a look at a cloud here. And here, what I've done is I've chosen kind of a nice, puffy, uh, cumulus cloud. Here's a little cumulus cloud. And on the top where the sun is hitting, it has um, beautiful, uh, beautiful, puffy, lumps and I can see the sun hitting some of those and on the underside I have the part that's in the shade. Very often the part that's in the shade won't be just, don't put black paint down there. It's usually going to be a warm gray because it's reflecting some warmth from the ground. It's reflecting light from the ground. Um, so sometimes you'll see even browns in the undersides of those clouds and a little bit of warm gray. In those. The upper part we're seeing um, highlights, the bottom part sort of a larger shadow. And so let me kind of go over to the page. And what, what I um, recommend that we do is we try to get our, our painting to look sort of like the cloud that we're seeing. If you try to make your, your cloud look exactly like the cloud that you're seeing, then um, it's going to move to a different shape before you're done. But I want it to, to really kind of represent that cloud type. So I will often, when I look up at the cloud, I'll sort of note its shapes, but I'm also gonna be aware that in five minutes, that cloud shape is gonna be different but I'm going to sort of copy it as quickly as I can, as best as I can, as best I can. And here are my tools. I am going to be using today some watercolor. 
and I'm going to be using a little gouache kit. My gouache kit has very few colors in it, but they're all really light value colors. And then when I am wanting darker colors, that's when I'm going to be using my regular um, watercolor palette. So these are we're going to just do some studies and then we're going to do a little landscapito with clouds. So let's do let's work on a little study here. <clears throat> Something that I've been uh, sort of generally doing at the start of um, of these drawings is I have been just throwing some um, some white paint and some light blue paint down on my page as a little base coat. And then with a, the gouache, I can kind of rub it back and forth, and that pushes that together. Something that is different about um, gouache versus watercolor is gouache will re-wet itself very, very easily. And uh, let's see if we can kind of get closer. To, to... Oh, that wasn't what was supposed to happen. Let's try that again. Select my camera. I was trying to get it down. Ah, it happened again. For some reason, this thing does. Oh, I'm gonna try it one other way. Select camera. And. And one of these is a zoom, isn't it? No. What was that zoom? Yeah. Oh, you're close. Well, let's just. Stick with this without. Oh, I, I can zoom this way. I can move my camera. It keeps wanting to come back here. There we are. And. Huh. Most inauspicious. Come on, okay. I think my poor little document camera is on the fritz. Let's say <laughs> That was a moment of something that kind of looked right. Have to get a new document camera. We'll make this work. All right. So there is there's some paint. Oh, sorry, Jack. Um, could you uh take the uh. Oh, oh yes. All those panels. Is that better? Um, there's one more panel left. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Thank there you. Go. All right. So, um, the so if I'm if I'm drawing a cloud, I'm very often in these or when I'm doing these little gouache studies, I'll first just sort of put in some color. Um, the the color of blue that I can get with my gouache is this 
one here. Um, if I want that to be a darker blue, then what I can do is I can get there with, with some watercolor. And I put the watercolor right on top of the gouache. And so I put that on, and I notice that I'm kind of fading it down as it went down the page it faded the the amount of blue in it faded and the reason is i'm using a water brush here so as i'm going down it is making um uh the the amount of paint on my brush is running out but it's still staying damp so it still keeps painting so if you haven't had experience working with um a um with a water brush before that's sort of the way that it works. Um, another thing that I can do is I can add a little bit here I'm going to add a little bit of I've got some sort of a peachy color here a little bit of brown. Um, I'm going to add a little bit of that into the sky on the bottom of the page. Generally speaking, um, skies the higher it is up here in the sky, the kind of the cooler, and you'll often see close to the horizon, the colors getting paler and paler and paler. And if there's any dust or other sorts of things in the atmosphere lower down, you'll get the lower atmosphere being, um, you can actually see kind of a lot of warmth as well as a lighter value near the horizon. So I've got kind of a, a gradient here of of those colors if i have a um if i have a a, a, a drawing where let's say i have i'm going to now kind of do a vertical format here And let's say I've got some kind of ground element down here. This zone down here is lighter. It's getting light blue here, more of light cyan, and then more of a blue, darker blue up here. But there are clouds in the way. So I'm going to put a little kind of cloud here. And I'm going to put a cloud here. And there's another little cloud there. I may even link some of these up. There's kind of a series of clouds here. If I get something where I've got more of my clouds actually, um, I'm going to sort of, with this uh, pen, I'm going to mark in sort of where these clouds are so that this sort of makes a little bit, is a little bit more clear in case it's not coming out very well on your so let's say I've got some, uh, you know, big kind of uh, up, up here in the sky, there's, there's a, there's a big, there's a big cloud. And then there, I've got a little hole in my clouds, I can see um, through there, there maybe there's a hole in that cloud. And then near the horizon, I've got some other clouds. I now have sort of several different. So that's what I'll what I'll what you can do is you can put you know into your high spot you know, um, one color and then kind of go to sort of a more more of a cyan in here. So what you can actually do is, as you're kind of going down your page, just use different, getting more cyan as you go down the page. And down here, I'm going to throw in a little bit of gouache with this. Oh, but not that much. These things here are all done with watercolor. You can see how those blues are sort of grayed out a little bit. If I put the gouache in, you can see how the gouache makes more of a brighter blue. 
and I can tint those gouaches, that, those gouache bits with watercolor. So if I want to make this one more of a blue, see that on the gray paper that shows up a little bit better. I think I want to make that more blue. So what I'm doing here is if my sky is interrupted by kind of cloud moments, then in those little pockets that go down, I am using, I'm using different colors of blue, suggesting this kind of a gradient. All right. But let's say I want some clouds on that. Um, and, or, and I also can play with putting some clouds on this. Um, I'm going to let this paint dry. If I'm out in, the, in the, the field, I find that this dries really, really quickly because I've got sunlight beating down on it. If you're in a very humid place, of course, that uh, takes a lot longer. But I'm going to use my hair dryer here because I'm inside and this doesn't want to dry. That's good. So for, for these um, sorts of uh, clouds here, I am, um, I want, if I've got gouache behind it, I need to make sure that's dry before I try to paint my cloud on it. And the reason is that, let me just put down some wet paint, all right? Here's a little bit of wet paint. If I get myself some, some gouache, and this is, it's, I can still actually see kind of gloss of that water on there. Um, if I put white on top of that, at first it looks good, but then what happens is the wet um, paint that is underneath it starts to mix with that, um, that gouache, and I'm going to see more of that, that that coming through. So as this dries, I'm going to see some of my um, a lot of a lot of that sort of light color that is underneath it kind of showing through. So this is getting a little bit more blue as it dries. But still, you're seeing now here also the advantage of using this gouache paint. I was able to paint white on top of something that was a darker value. This is really dry, so I'll get even better effects. So I'm just looking at that cloud over there on the left, and it has an upper sort of poofy part. Notice the little kind of jiggle that I've got in my brush here. I'm kind of, my, my hand kind of moving around in a, um, in a, in a, in a, kind of bouncy mode is intentional. I want to kind of get this a little bit jiggly and that's going to give me effects that are are going to look a little bit more natural. I'm going to try not to with that that brush kind of go ba boom ba boom ba boom ba boom ba boom ba boom. Again, my motion of my hand, I was jiggling it. And you see there are some parts now as it's drying when this went when it first went on it looked a lot more opaque 
But notice as this is drawing, these little cloud effects here are there. It's, it's starting bold, but then that's going to get a little bit more pale as this dries. Looking back on that cloud on the left hand side, I noticed that there are some real highlights where the sun is hitting this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up a little bit of paint, but I'm going to make this a little bit thicker. I don't want this to be wet. I want this to be a little bit pasty almost. And when I've got it in more of a pasty condition, so here's painting with this sort of more pasty. If it's too pasty, it's sort of, sort of oh, that's, that's good. And what I'm going to do now is go on top of this and be the, 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 the sunlight that is hitting the, the top edges of, of some of these cloud parts. The top edges of those are nice and crisp. I'm now going to clean my brush by squeezing it and wiping it on this little rag here. And now with my clean brush, I'm going to just come along and tickle the bottom edges of that. And what that's going to do is it's going to make the bottom edge of that just a little bit more subtle. Doesn't look quite, see this part here looks like a brush stroke, right? It looks like you put white paint in there. But if I come in here and I'm going to just soften that bottom part. This, this paint over here is pretty dry. But that, again, the cool thing about gouache paint is that even when it's dry, gouache re-wets so I can soften that bottom edge. And it's looking more like these, 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 these cloud parts like popping. Right? So it's got a harder outer edge. And let me just sort of down here on one of these blotches kind of demonstrate what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm coming along with my clean brush. This is my blotch of paint. And I'm softening the bottom edge of it so that it has one hard edge and one softer edge. If I did that with this little clump here, I would kind of just pull out one bottom edge. So I want there still to be a hard edge in there. Look at my cloud in the, 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 the painting over in the photograph. There's also those shadows. I can put some gray into there. But another thing that you can do to kind of create some of those effects is I can just brush my brush in here and remove a little bit of the paint that's on the page in that area. And then a little bit more of the gray of the paper comes through. So there I made that part a little bit darker. Let's say right in here, let's say I want some of this part down here to be a little bit darker. I have my paper is darker than this light value here. So if I push some of this gouache out of the way, 
I just made made a little dark spot. I could also get a very similar effect by I could take some gray paint here. This is gray gouache. Right. And it's very close to the color of my paper. Soften some of the edges of that. So we've got a question about is there um, more water there is there more water used the farther you are from the harder um, most outer edges? No, no, that's that's just um, so <clears throat> let me put a kind of a glob of white in here, right? So what's happening is is the reason it's fading out is that I'm not that I'm using more water water. But I'm coming in here, the paint is now on the brush. And as I come this way, I'm running out of paint. So I'm not, it's not that I'm squeezing, I'm not actually squeezing at all. I am, um, I'm letting the brush dampen the paint, move the paint, and then my brush runs out of paint. And those are crazy cool clouds. And you actually, I, what, what was, was, was fun when I was out there in Tanzania is the clouds that I was looking at, they had these little kind of bright edges and these sort of grays. Here, I'm not, I'm not even really drawing the bottoms of these clouds. They're all kind of blending into each other. Um, that looks really cloudy. That's fun. Well, actually, first let me check. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, I think so. Okay. Well, this is drying over here. Let me pop over here. So, I mean, that's I mean, that's that's some satisfying cloud business. Let's let's take a look here at at just sort of some some general thoughts about dark on clouds. So, look over here on this cloud here. Notice that this cloud that is close to you has it's got a really soft edge down here that's fuzzy and look at how much of it is gray look at how much of that cloud is gray now this one over here it's got more white towards the top it's got crisper edges and this one down here has got gray down on the bottom edge of it and most of the top is light colored huh What's going on here? Well, imagine yourself looking up directly under a cloud that is overhead. The entire bottom of that cloud is going to be in shade. If that cloud moves, if you move out from underneath that cloud and start to look back at it, you'll start to see a little bit of the top edge of it that is in, um, in, in light. And the further you are away from that cloud, the more of that you will see. So things that are closer to overhead will be higher in the picture plane that you're drawing. So what you can do is for clouds towards the top of your picture, have more of the underside of it be gray. And ones that are lower in your picture plane have more of the tops of them be light. One last thing I want to point out the little bit of a silver lining on this cloud right up here and you see the same thing happening here. I'm not going to let that shadow go all the way to the edge. I'm going to give it a little bit of a light edge. But notice that the cloud towards the top of this photograph has more gray on more of the underside of it because you're looking at more of the bottom of that cloud. So what does that mean over here? It means this cloud is going to be mostly gray, this cloud some, and these clouds over here more white on the top. Let's put that in. 
So I'm going to get some white. I'm going to take that for a little spin on my palette right there. Got white on my brush. Test it before it hits down here. And this one here, I might have some lights along the edge of that and maybe along the bottom of this. And then in this next little cloud here, re-tap, we hit this tap right here. I've got more white on top of that. And the ones on the very bottom, I think I like the way the top cloud is working. This one here, I'm going to soften some of these edges. Maybe put a little bit of white in here. Really soften up along here. I think the bottom of this also needs some warmth. Let's take a look at one more little cloud scene and just sort of play around with this. So I've got now got a number of other kind of puffy cumulus clouds. Notice that same thing going on. This cloud towards the top, I'm seeing it as being more rough and uneven because it is closer to me. I'm seeing more of it as being gray. I am seeing down here, these ones have more white on the top and then there's some gray on the bottom edges. So if I've got a bunch of those sorts of clouds going by, this one also has a, I'm seeing a kind of a big gradation in uh, color. I, what I'm gonna do is, let's say I've got, let's turn this into a, a fast landscape drawing. So I keep this small, I'm going to be able to kind of do these a lot more quickly. I'm going to first get some gouache down on my page. This is not a good color for the sky, but it's going to get some sort of gouache base 
down there. Quickly get some color in. I'm going to now blue that sky up a little bit. What color of blue is that? That is a little bit of cobalt coming in there. Gives me some cooler blue at the top. And then I could just mix that in with the gouache. Uh, and then my brush is running out of paint down here. So now I grab some white. I'm going to put that down here. And then I'm going to mix that with the gouache in here. And you're thinking like, oh no, this doesn't, this, there's no transition there. It doesn't look, no, it doesn't look like a smooth transition. Well, with, with the, 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 the gouache, I can keep sort of playing with it and it starts to get smooth. So gouache, because it re-wets, you're able to kind of move that sort of stuff where watercolor would stick just a little bit more. At this point, the surface of this paper is really saturated. And if I keep kind of coming in there, I'm going to start to bead the paper up. What that means is I'm going to turn this paper surface into pulp. And it is going to, um, and that will just sort of make a, make a mess. Let me kind of just give an example of that. So if I just get this paper wet here and I start scrubbing on it, and I keep scrubbing on it. Oh, it's starting to happen, right? Um, oh, it's not really showing up on your view. If I turn tilt this, can you see the little nuggets of the little nuggets of paper? I'll put some. Maybe I'll put some paint into this, and maybe that will get some of those beads to. Yeah, now we're starting to kind of see those little see those little nuggets. Ah, right. I don't want that. What I've done is I've turned my paper to pulp. Right. If this is wet and I, and, I, and I kind of, by the time I get sort of my gradient done, if I'm thinking to myself like, I'm kind of close to the point where I am going to, um, I'm close to the point where I'm going to uh, turn my paper to pulp stop paint something else draw something else find a little flower at your feet and let this dry while you're doing you're distracted by something else all right then i can paint right on top of that so i'm going to hit this with my hair dryer just to speed us up here Go there. By the way, if I have good watercolor paper, this isn't really an issue. Good watercolor paper um, is not going to be, you know, uh, turning into little beads quite as quickly. So you can work with it much longer, much better. But this is just, you know, light sort of sketchbook paper material. Here. Now let's look at those those cloud shapes. There's a big cloud up here. It's going to be have sort of looser edges to it. And it's going to be up at the top of my page. So there's a big thing. There's another little nugget of cloud then poofing out onto the right here. And I'm, I'm intentionally kind of, again, I've got that little jitter in my hand because I don't want, if, if, I, if I'm in painting like this, I get too much sort of controlled shapes. 
And if I'm painting a little bit more jittery, I can get much more of these sort of uh, more organic feeling shapes. Let's get this, especially towards the top of this one here, a little bit darker. Down below here, I've got some clouds that are really, really bright. You know, so this isn't exactly true to that cloud shape, but it is eh, kind of close. Now, if I had other clouds closer to the horizon, they would be smaller. They are going to be closer together. Now, I'm going to play with some of those bold edges in this cloud. That top edge. I think I want a little bit more white in this. Over here, I want to get some thicker paint. Down here, some really thick paint. Some thick white in here. Put a little bit of a silver lining on this parts in here. Are there any parts that I want to be darker? I can do that again by lifting out some of my white. I lift that out, I clear it with my brush here, get my brush clean again, and lift out more. I can also get some of those similar effects by taking some gray paint here. And I'm not going to put it all the way against the edge, I can bring it into my heart. But it does look much more kind of gray rather than having that blue shine through. This one over here, get a little bit of gray on the bottom. Any part that feels too hard, you can get in there. Soften those edges with the gouache. Again, the gouache, look, this, this has been here for a long time, right? That's totally dry. But look at this, I get in here and I start moving around. I can lift that gouache right up.
that is a little bit of how those cloud effects were made. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm using some toned paper. I'm using a mixture of my gouache and watercolor. Watercolor when I want things to be a little bit darker. Gouache when I am uh, for my, my light values. And that is giving me um, effective cumulus cloud effects. Um, I, wait, why don't I just throw some cirrus clouds in here in the background on this one, just because we've been we, we've had uh, just sort of a, a, a lot of cumulus clouds here. Um, but let's say there is some cirrus clouds in the background. What I can do is just lightly tickle the paper with my brush here. And realize that when you first put it on, that it is going to be, I'm gonna fan that tip out. See how I, whoops. So how I have fanned the tip of my brush there. And finally, I'm going to have an airplane fly in the background. That is some fun ideas and techniques for um, gouache cloudscapes. Again, my palette of gouache is limited, light value things. And here um, I use some white, I use this sort of pale pink here, I used a little bit of that brown and I used a little bit of this light blue. I just go to my art supply store, whatever one is near me, and I look through their rack and what are the lightest values of gouache I can buy. And then I you know, throw some of those into my kit. Um, Anything that I don't have, I can always supplement with something like this. Like, let's say I didn't have, I wanted a light pink. Um, what I could do is I could take white paint, put that down, get some pink, and paint over the gouache with your watercolor, and then you can you can get a lot of other other colors. So the watercolor kit with your smorgasbord with the light value gouache, that's a that's a a portable, reasonable way to go. And that is my gouache tips for the day. Um, so, um, what, so, are there any questions? I see a question in the chat from Michael Helm. Oh, good. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. He's asking, how would your cloud strategy strategy shift without the toned paper? So you can put watercolor down of what uh, what with whatever you're seeing. With with your, if you're using white paper, um, I've actually done some past classes on on this. Uh, maybe I'll show, not tell. Let me grab a piece of white paper and we'll throw in just sort of a quick kind of uh, a, a quick skyscape just with using white paper. I have done other classes where it's been all about that. Um, so this was a little bit kind of a unique thing, kind of drawing these light colored clouds on tone paper. But let me, uh, let me grab this for you. Uh, Michael, I'm so delighted that you could join us today. I miss adventuring with you. All right. 
let's have a bonus cloud on white paper. And here, I'm, I, I usually don't really use the gouache on the white paper, um, unless I make a mistake and I want to cover something up. Um, the, um, so, um, so what I'm going to try to do with the, with the, the watercolor is I, I could make a big block of blue with a graded wash, let that dry, and then do this gouache technique over that. That would work. Um, but very often uh, with the white paper, I can let some of that white of the paper show through and be the light parts of my clouds. So in this, I'm gonna, my general approach is, I'm gonna figure out where my cloud is. I'm gonna put in some of the darks in the sort of a, a wet and wet, and then um, I am going to, um, while my paper is still damp, I'm going to come around and I'm going to add in the blue of my sky. So I'm going to actually get my paper wet. I'm going to then, well, you'll see. Let's just go there now. I want to do this. I want to that that and there all right um here is my watercolor kit and roughly in this area i'm going to be creating a cloudscape there might be some landscape features down below, but I'm going to, there's going to be a big cloud uh, closer up in here. Um, and then uh, some small clouds down here, and then uh, maybe some cumulonimbus clouds, uh, those, those, those thunderheads near the, near the horizon here. We might get to see, should we head out to Sierra Nevada Field Campus this, um, this summer? So I've got a purple gray colored here called Shadow Violet that is one of my favorites. I like that a lot. Um, look at this weird thing. I'm going to take this big flat brush and I'm going to make my page wet. And I'm going to get this wet all the way down. Oh, wet sky. And I was overzealous. And I put too much water on. So I'm going to blot up randomly some parts here. So some parts of my page are drier. Some parts are wetter. If I were smart, I would have left some just as like totally uh, dry paper. So I want to have, there's a, now a mixture of wetter spots and drier spots on my page. Why would you want to do that? Well, it's gonna the 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 the, the paper um, the the paint is gonna behave differently when it hits dry versus wet, and I'm going to kind of come in here, test this out here. Then remember there was a cloud here. I'm put, I'm painting in the the bottoms of these clouds. This one near the top, maybe I want even more. And then down in here, All right, so I've got some blotchy um, grays going on in here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix up some, got some blue paint here. So this is some cobalt blue and test that out on the side. That'll work for me. And what I'm going to do is I am going to bring that into my sky and let the edge of it 
I'm going to put in just some little dots of it here. And as it comes down the page here, I'm letting I'm letting the the the, the paper um, the wet paper determine the cloud shape. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. As I come down lower on the page, um, I am going to shift from cobalt blue to more of a, um, a cyan. This is manganese um, blue hue from Daniel Smith. And I am... And because the paper's wet, it's doing all sorts of really fun little things. Notice this kind of this cool change when you go from the cobalt to the manganese. But look at what the water color, what the water just did on its own there. You get those sort of crazy accidental effects when you've just you're letting water kind of blend things as it will trying to let there be a little bit of kind of glow around some of the edges of these things. And then I want that sky to feel darker, I mean brighter, I make this ground darker. And there is a little Skyscape. Maybe I have this be a mountain here. Um, with where on on the on the on the white paper. So I again in fast time, my strategy was to wet the paper, but now I'm actually being better about it. I'm partially wetting my paper. All right, so I've got a few dry spots. Then I can even do this with this brush here. I am going to take this little flat. I'm going to get some purpley grays. I'm going to put them in here. Uh, there's some cloud shadows in here. Then I am I'm 
going to switch from cobalt blue to manganese blue hue. And I have some edges that are soft, some edges that are hard. You can even poke some sky holes into white parts. And that that's sort of the big difference between how I would approach it with with the white paper. Flat brushes, by the way, are wonderful, wonderful little things. You, you don't think you can... Uh, you, when I first started, I thought, like, I want something where I can control it. These, these flat brushes, you really get some wonderful effects if, with when you're brushing with them. <clears throat> Um, very often my strokes are, I'm, I'm kind of twisting it so that um, I can get, um, it's going to do sort of different angles and things. So that's useful for foliage, it's useful in skies, it kind of creates a randomness in things that you really can't get with one of these. You can just you can pop a hole in any cloud. Um, Michael, did that did that help? Michael is saying in the chat that it's really helpful. Great. Um, yeah, no mic today for. Michael, wish you look, looking forward to seeing you again though. Um, so that is um, here I am. Hi. Uh, so um, are there can you put gouache on the white paper? Nancy, yes you can. Absolutely. Um, the, so I'm going to let this dry a little bit and then, um, we can drop that, um, on there. Um, uh, so by the way, you'll find some people really disdain gouache and that's because at some point, some people were told that like, like watercolor is like the pure medium and like this gouache stuff where it's. It's a pig, like this is, this is not what we do. And if you are a sort of a watercolor purist and that's something that you really enjoy, that's good, that's fine. But just sort of also be aware that it's okay to use whatever medium you like. It's not an official watercolor painting. It's mixed media, it's watercolor, it's wash. Um, I think a lot of illustrators, um, uh, use gouache and it kind of got uh, labeled as like oh that's for like making commercial art like the, the watercolorist that's going to be like the artist artist and so there's uh, gouache people get dissed it's all art <laughs> um, do whatever makes you happy and that's that's good so um, Nancy, let's drop some, a little bit of gouache onto some of those cloud shapes that I just made. 
Um, and are you still wet? No, I'm dry. Okay, what about you? Yeah, I'm dry too. Okay, great. Um, so like this cloud here is not making me happy. All right. So what I'm going to do is I am going to throw my brush into it. I'm going to make it up into some thick paste. So I don't want to squeeze it right now or I get a big thing of water in there. I want to keep this as more of a thick paste because then I'm going to come along here. Oh, that's too thick a paste. If it's too thick a paste, then it doesn't flow off my brush. I was so excited about making a thick paste. I made a very, very thick paste. Still pretty thick. That's usually not my problem. So I'm kind of getting some I'm gonna bring some Work with me, brush. Here we are. Now I'm going to soften some of the bottoms of these gouache marks. When I soften the bottom of it, it really, it goes from looking like a brush stroke to looking like something that's sort of blending in with that shape. So here I just put some gouache on top of some of those marks and put my hand in my other mountain. Ah, sorry mountain. But uh, yes, you can uh, use your gouache with your, um, you can use your gouache with the, the 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 watercolor on white paper as well it's not something that is restricted to um just uh toned paper now let's see one two um the so the, the main difference between watercolor and gouache, gouache is opaque and it re-wets really easily. I mean, it, it, it reactivates when it's wet. So um, you put down transparent blazes of watercolor and you're seeing through them and seeing all those different colors. With gouache, I put down this on top of that, just like oil paints, it's going to really block a lot of the stuff that is below it, unless I use it in a really dilute way. Oh, Avea, <laughs> tell us about the zombie paint. Um, our friend Gabby started calling it the zombie paint because when you re -wet, when you re -wet it, it comes back to life. <laughs> uh, Don't do it, Jack. Don't do it. <laughs> Brains. <laughs> Um, the, um, and, and so, yes, you can paint over gouache, but you have to do it lightning fast because you don't want the gouache to reactivate. So if I'm mucking around with multiple layers and wash and moving my brush around, the gouache goes like, oh, you want me to be active again? I am active. I am your friend. I am gouache. Right. However, <clears throat> um, if I come down and just sort of do like one quick stroke over it, I, I then I can um, then I can tint that gouache different colors or 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 um, uh, or, or paint. <laughs> um, the uh, so so let me let me tint some gouache. Tint some gouache. I'm gonna tint some gouache. Uh, all right so um let's go here all right 
let's say that this was a sunset and these were clouds that were turning orange. Getting some orange watercolor. Some quinacridone sienna there. And the top of them is still maybe it's white. So in here I can I can tint I can tint gouache. Um, another thing I can do if I have my 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 my, my paint here. Um, there's there's a telephone pole um, blocking part of this. So I can paint, I can paint over that without um, disturbing the gouache. But if I monkey around in here too much, then I'm going to, that gouache is going to turn wet and it's going to start moving around on me again. Um, but, um, but I can get away with, uh, you know, painting on top of it. If I do a lot of painting on top of it, then you'll start to see, like, let's say I was painting, you know, something across here and sort of coming in here. See, oh, it's already happening. See this little pale stuff in here? That's that gouache that is now reactivated in the brown. And I now have so sort of cream in your coffee color paint right here because I muckied around in the gouache a little bit and that gouache reactivated. However, over here, I'm not going to, I'm just going to put one stroke and stop. Um, so the paint is staying where it is and it's not reactivating. If I want that to be really dark and opaque, I can do that, but I just need to make sure that that paint that I'm painting over it is dark and opaque, right? So I can paint over this but just realize that there's this there's this stuff that wants to kind of come up and it wants to play. Gouache wants to play. And if you get it wet, it will be it will come out and play. If you don't want the gouache to play, that's a problem. If you do want the gouache to pay, to play, then you're like, "Yay, my gouache is here." And then some of these ones they're actually turning pink by the horizon back here. Right. Um, let's see. Um, are there are there any other questions that you're seeing? Um, I'm seeing some. Um, some of them have been answered. One question is: Will will gouache be rewettable forever, or will it eventually dry at some very distant point in time? The thing that's fun about gouache is you can let it dry as dry as a chip, right? And then you come back, you get that wet, and it's like come back. It's like a tardigrade. Gouache is like a tardigrade. You think you have dried this water bear out completely you've you've wasted that water bear just add water and the water bear is is back gouache is a water bear and so the um what i do is i squeeze gouache into this little palette and um the uh, 
and I let these 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 tabs dry and they can dry completely and I re-wet it in here and just like watercolor it's back to play with me and um, the the danger of putting it into a little palette like this is that you will find that um, gouache uh, when you put it into these little chambers and it dries, watercolor, watercolor dries to nice little neat tabs. Gouache, when you dry it, it gets brittle and it cracks and then chunks start falling out all over the place. And this drives people nuts, right? You've had that experience, Savea? Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. It's rough. And then you have like all these, you open this up and all these little shards fall out. So I did a workshop. Um, have, have I done a workshop with this crew on creating the little gouache palette so that they won't fall out? About a year ago. And I can put that in the chat again. Um, I put it in a bit earlier. Great. So we've got a video on if, if you want to create your own gouache palette that doesn't crack into a bazillion pieces, you can do that. We'll link to that. Um, the basic secrets are I have actually a little piece of little pieces of fabric embedded inside of these. And in addition to that, um, as they were drying, I was squishing them down with my fingers, re-mashing them into each other so that they wouldn't retract and contract into all these separate little broken pieces. So that as it was drying, I was re-mushing it into the sort of semi, when it's sort of in the semi-plastic state. I re-matted it and then but there's also reinforcing fabric embedded in each one of these things and you can learn more about that in that other video. Um, yeah I, that, that's that's fun to think about the water bear the water bear paint. Oh my gosh part one we build the palette that no oh, thank you so much um, Avea. so Avea has just dropped into the chat the Oh My Gouache um, uh, workshop. And uh, that's the one where we build that palette. So um, in about a half an hour, I have to bounce between then and now. I'd love to see what's happening in your sketchbooks, in your journals, um, or if you did any kind of monkeying around with gouache at home today while we were doing this, please share that. And we're gonna try to get to a bunch of folks um, I see um, uh, Kate and Ray Bonto and Susan. Thank you folks uh, so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to start with um, our friend Kate Chandler. Hey, Kate, I haven't seen you for a while. Um, I hope you're doing well. Yes, so that has been because I've been doing well, luckily. Um, there was a while where vet work kind of, or the vet industry kind of got to me and I was struggling to find time for the things I like. So I did what any sane person would do to combat this. I got a horse. So now I have Timber, the horse that you guys met in my yard. Um, Timber is now your horse. Well, the conditions of that, I'm not entirely sure what they are, but the guy who owns him got a girlfriend and he doesn't have much time for his horses. So I said, Greg, can I have Timber? He goes, sure. And so I took the trailer out there and I brought him to my house. And I have been out awesome. there playing ever since. It's also garden season. And during garden season, I turned to a bit of a crazy person. It's the time where I'm setting everything up. And I'm hoping that once I'm not hurrying to get everything into the ground as fast as possible, that I'll have more time to sit there and sketch. But things have been going very well. And yeah, I'll show you what I have in my sketchbook because I've been trying to be better about documenting the things that are around me instead of drawing from. Uh, right. I'm gonna hide. Pictures. I'm gonna hide me so to make you big. Oh, okay. uh, remove. Bing. Oh, tell us about. So this. Here's a page of local botany. Um, we have the skunk cabbages coming up. We've got salmon berry. I can't remember the name of this one off the top of my head, but it's very pretty and it's everywhere. Um, and then the huckleberries are just starting to bud out. And they're Ooh. about to flower. Oh, and that is is that that one with the the um, yellow. Uh, that, tell us about this, the natural history of this uh, yellow one on the bottom. That looks like a really cool... Yeah, the skunk cabbage, basically. I think I've heard somewhere that they can push up even through snow 
um, because they're just that determined. I think Susan told me that. Um, yeah, they're a very impressive plant. I haven't noticed them to be that stinky. Apparently the uh, West Coast ones are edible. Um, they also don't look that appetizing either. They're very cool and I love them, but I kind of look at that, I go, look at all these tasty nettles and chickweeds eat. I'm not sure if I need to be eating the skunk cabbage. Mm -hmm. uh, but I should probably try it just for, um, just to say I did. Um, uh, let's see. Do we know? And then I've been drawing. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, do Do we know what the pollinator is on those? I don't actually. Do you? I I don't. I don't. I'll look into that. Anyways, I tried drawing some backyard birds, and they look a little funny. And that's because I finished the painting early in the morning. I went out to go feed the horses. I came back and someone had knocked over my water and had rolled in the painting and smudged all up so I had to paint over the top of it again. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're the culprit. <laughs> Who do you think was the culprit? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you've got guilty kitties. Um, yeah, well... I've been learning how to draw dogs and cats because I've been working in a vet clinic. And um, as a receptionist, I meet about 30 to 40 dogs and cats a day. Um, and so I thought there's no excuse not to learn how to draw them. And so recently I started doing some uh, like educational illustrations for the vet clinic. Like, um, you know how what the lion cut is for cats? When they get groomed, it's basically where you know, they cut off most of the cat's coat, especially if cats are getting old and can't groom themselves or um, they have a medical condition and it just helps keep them up with grooming and everything for whatever reason, but they look really silly. And because we're not a groomer, we're a vet's office and we only do it for medical reasons. Sometimes pet owners will call us and be like, why does my cat look like a weird little alien? Like, well, I'm sorry, we just did the medical cut. I know he looks weird, I'm so sorry. And so I made a chart where people can like fill out or they have a couple preset options that I drew. And then they have a chart where they can fill in where they would like us to leave hair on their cat. So hopefully that keeps us from getting yelled at by any uh, disgruntled um, cat owners. Okay, can, can we see the cat chart? The, the, the trim my I'll cat bring, chart? I'll bring a copy of it next week. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then here's some more local botany and backyard birds. Oh, fine. Um, yeah, the dead nettles are coming up. Does anyone know what those are good for? I know they're good for something. Um, I need to look that one up. Also, the robins are having their robin wars this time of year, um, where they just fly around screaming at each other constantly. <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, yeah, I have my squash stuff from today. Oh, fine. Yeah. I'll and also, and I agree. you can try on, on toned paper as well. I think you're going to... You, you, I you're... will. I have a pad of toned paper that I mean to use. It is brown, though. So I don't know how that will work for skies, but definitely give that a shot. Yeah, I, 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 like, I really like brown toned paper as well. I, actually, I, I, every time I'm kind of getting re-upping a, a sketchbook, I always have this dilemma. Do I go gray or do I go brown? Uh, right. Warm tone or cool. Yeah. No, it's a hard call to make. Right now, I'm just using one of the Stillman and Burn ones. This one is into watercolor one. My next one will be this one just to have a mixed media. And um, the watercolor sits on there a bit more than I'd like it to. But I'm kind of jumping around trying to find the perfect sketchbook because right now I want something that will hold more watercolor because I've been doing more like watercolor stuff. And I want to do more of that in the field instead of the sketchbooks for more sketchy stuff. Um, Especially if I'm able to go ride out to locations and then go park and spend a couple hours painting and come home. Then I'd like to have a sketchbook that can really put up with like intensive water coloring. That's great. If, um, yeah. Let us know the results of this experimentation. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. We want to hear your. Well, I need to get better at kind of documenting painting and hopefully you know, I'll try and start the YouTube channel back up again and see if I can do something like a much less intense version of what Marley does, um, but yeah. Great. Really great to see you. Oh, great to see you guys too. And, Thanks. And for... I'm glad that uh, timber is in your backyard now. 
yes, yeah, I can see him out the window. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get him back on Nature Journal Club again. I'm sure he'd love the attention. That would, that would be really fun to do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. <laughs> that was great. Um, let's um, jump over to the UK. Um, Ray Bonto, it's great to see you. And, oops, there we are. And, hold on a second, I, now why is it that when I've got you spotlighted and just you, I don't see any feature that allows me to allow you to unmute? For some reason, if I add myself in here, then I can ask you to unmute. Now you can unmute. There we Hi. go. Hi there. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Oh, here we go. And this is on brown tone paper, right? Yeah. It just brings a nice warmth through to it. That is, so if anybody's wondering, will this work on my brown tone paper? Here is your answer. Unequivocally, yes. They're fun to do, aren't they? These little clouds yeah. on paper like this. Right. Um, and this morning I was going through the nearby woods. So those are some bluebells. Oh, this is so cool to see um, all those ones undeveloped up there and then the ones on the bottom hanging down. Oh, that. Oh, hold it uh, maybe center screen and hold it still for a second. We'll see if we can get it really focused on there. Oh. Yeah, so folks, look at the, that bottom right one. Look at the angles on those petals. So you're seeing one from the side, one three-quarter view towards you. Notice the asymmetry in the sides of that petal. You're really um, observing the angles on the individual petals, not just making this up out of your head. This is really great observation of those pedal angles. Thanks. And I was also watching the fruits. Oh, so the, uh, the, uh, a nice work on the water too. Oh, look at these guys, hold, yeah, hold, hold still, look at the page, they want it to focus. Oh, when they put their head down and charge? Yeah. Oh, no. that is such a great posture. Look at those, 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 those wings up. This is totally uh, Tunnicliffe. Uh, you and Tunnicliffe would probably have had a ton of fun uh, running around and sketching together with these, these, these posture things and then a few dropping in the color. Um, really strong anatomy in those, uh, those, those, those posture ones as well. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. That's cool. Um, Ray Bonto, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I'm glad you're, the weather's turning and you are, um, you're, you're, you're able to, to, uh, to get back out in the field again. Thank you. Um, let's bop over to the East Coast. Susan, um, it's great to see you. Um, and for some reason, I need to add myself into the spotlight. And now your Ask to Unmute button comes. There it is. That's, Yay. I think, a Hello. design thing that they need to fix in Zoom. In the yeah, meantime, that's weird. Yeah. It's great to see you. Yeah, good to see you. I, I thought, well, I have, I have a new page to share, but I just thought in, in light of um, Kate's uh, West Coast version of Skunk Cabbage, I, you've seen this before last year. This is from last year in March. This is our East Coast Skunk Cabbage. Um, which look very different. Like Kate's actually looks like a flower, um, but these are <laughs> related. And and Ivea, that was one of the families that uh, Ivea featured in Plant Families in Our Food Part Two. So oh, what, what family is skunk cabbage in? It, is, it, is that a, a raceae or is that, am I mixing up with the, with the different family? I remember it as a raceae. Yeah. So which includes a whole lot of like popular house plants like, um, like pothos and Monstera and all those and philodendrons are in that, but there's also a lot of like non-tropical ones that grow out here. And Jack in the Pulpit is also one that grows out here in the East, which is also in that family, which I really like. I, I, I always like weird plants. 
Yeah. But yeah. So yeah. Uh, um. And uh, Kate and Kate, like you, I I couldn't smell anything weird with them. I think the leaves, if you crush them, smell really like you're stinky and skunky. But um. Uh. Yeah. And and apparently, I think that they had they they were traditionally used by Native Americans for food. But I don't know. How, I don't know if you have to cook them first. I'm not going to try it without looking into it because I, I don't know. But yeah. But they're really just weird looking. And and these ones, they this is this was in March. I actually had it. This was last year. I intended to get out there before the snow melted, so I could see them growing through the snow. And then the snow just melted very quickly, and it just. Uh, huh. I, I um, really like this. Um, the the three quarter, the, not the three quarter view. The um, the little uh, block diagram in here as well. Yeah, I think that, 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 that I think that was like just after you'd done a class on block diagrams, and I was like, oh, a perfect opportunity. So you could yeah. see what else I just like all grow in all the swampy areas. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I was just want to show that off just, just to compare our, our different botany. <laughs> so it's fun. But um, yeah, but this 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 is my my newest most recent adventure. Um, uh, so oh, oh so so I'm I'm at the Albany Pine Bush. I've gotten involved in um, uh, I've signed up for all the citizen science stuff, <laughs> and I was officially which I've already done some things, but now I'm doing more. I just got trained for for uh, the Woodcock surveys so i'm gonna go out and survey woodcocks ask them what political party they're going to support and all that kind of stuff um mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh yeah and i'm also the officially out of the a volunteer oh, sorry you can't leave the woodcocks out of the census of course not of course not they're yeah. very important they're very important parts of they, they go out and they go they go me <laughs> me <laughs> it's so great i love them so much um but yeah so but i'm also now officially a volunteer naturalist at the pine bush which basically means that you're supposed to go out on the trail and take note of like species that you see. So I'm already doing that. So now I can do it in a way that helps pine bush. It's great. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, so, and, and that's yeah. where you saw all those moths, right? Well, the, so, so the buck moths, you mean last year? Yeah. Yes. So that, that's, one, that's one of the community science uh, things that I've actually done for a couple of years now. And I'm going to continue to do uh, serving buck moths. Um, which um, that particular subspecies is very, very, this, this, this area is one of the very, very few inland pine barrens habitats. And so that, that they say local, globally rare, locally significant, I forget something to state, I forget the, deep, the, 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 the catchphrase, but it's, it's a very, very rare type of habitat. And it supports a lot of like very specific species that can only live in, in that type of habitat. So this is one of them, uh, is the, the frosted elfin butterfly, which comes out very, very early in the spring. We had heat wave last week, and so I, like, they're definitely going to be out for sure. So I went out and I did oh, spot them. You got a thermoregulating. Um, hmm? Is that, is that yeah. thermoregulating behavior there? Yeah, I think, I think so. So the thing is, is usually when I see them, usually they're, they're, they're perching and their wings are perpendicular to the sun. Yeah. And so, which is great because you can get some great photos of them because you, they're all lit up. However, on this day, uh, they were not doing that. Oh. oh <laughs> actually, oh, up 90 that day. So, is yeah, that... they were, I noticed they were all, they would all come and land and immediately do a little twirl and they would get like directly like parallel to the sun so that they were not getting too much heat. And of course, that meant that it was very hard to get any pictures or see any detail on their wings, they're very, very tiny. Um, and they're very tiny and dark. And, I, and, I, and I'm guessing that that is an adaptation for living in the very early spring when it's usually pretty chilly. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're very dark colored, uh, but it's not helping when we have almost 90 degrees in April. <laughs> so What, what a, a fun set of observations. Yeah. See, this whole idea of you know, looking close enough and paying enough and attention over to a place over time to be able to know that, you know, this behavior that I'm seeing on these butterflies is not typical. First of all, to be mad points for looking at the behavior of the butterflies, and then to have the history with a place so you know how the behavior, uh, the behavior changes in hot weather and cold weather. That's so much fun. Yeah, I'll have to keep tracking. This is another odd thing. That one thing I have also noticed from previous years is that early in April, I almost always see them landing on the ground or on a plant that's very, very close to the ground. They usually don't fly very high at all. And for some reason on this day, they were always coming and perching on a little twig or something 
that was a foot or two above the ground. So that was like another weird thing. And then another weird thing, I don't ever see these guys fly this high. There's a related species called the Eastern Pine Elfin. You guys, I think, have Western Pine Elfins and that feeds on um, pine needles. And I saw some a guy like 10 feet up in, in one of our pitch pine trees. And I was like, is that an Eastern Pine Elfin? Because I don't see them very often. They're here, I just don't see them. Got on my binoculars, could barely see anything because it was backlit by the sun. <laughs> But I figured out it was not an Eastern Pine Elfin. I think it was a Frosted Elfin. I don't know what it was doing up there, but you know, maybe it was trying. So these guys actually feed on lupins. And uh, so they'll, they'll lay their eggs on the lupins although the lupins aren't sprouted yet. So I'm not quite sure what they're laying their eggs on, but we'll find out. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. So, yeah, so it's super fun. And, uh, uh, oh, and, and Jen's asking, was the blue done with gouache? Yes, I, I did some, some blue with the gouache. I was thinking to get the, so the green gouache in for the pine needles, but it's how they actually look, they sort of stand out nicely like that. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's really fun. <laughs> Susan, you've been, uh, you've been, you've been keeping your curious on and now you're involved with all these citizen science projects. That's oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> Got a little, a, starting to get a little overwhelming because I have a lot of different things I have to keep track of, but I'll make it all work. <laughs> It'll be good. <laughs> it, it is it's rough with just you know one lifetime and so much wonder that's really cool thank you um let's uh bounce back over to the other side and join our um our our co-host um avea moore uh great to see you great to see you too um before i begin to share just time check to, um do you need to go? Because I want to make sure you, um, we don't make you late oh, for you. Uh, thank you. Let me double check. No, I still have a little bit of time, but I need to. I'm uh, teaching um, evolutionary biology at um, a local elementary school. And um, the, the teacher who was there was struggling with it. And so I volunteered to kind of um, come in there and do that. So I have to bounce fairly soon to do that. But um, that would mean I need to leave in a half an hour, which means we've still got time. OK, awesome. I'll still try to be fast. No, no, um, no, no. Take your time, because I haven't actually looked in your journals in a, in a spell. What's up with your, what's, what's happening in your notebook? First of all, um, just um, about, um, what's I call it, uh, clouds and whatnot, wanted to um, also, uh, when you said about the dark and uh, no, not dark, um, the wet and dry patches, I tried that at one point. I was at my son's school uh, about a month or two ago, and so I tried doing that because I wanted the edges to to get better. And so it made kind of these cool fractal patterns depending on how wet the edges were. Because um, I tried earlier with the pencils because I had these mackerel skies and it didn't quite hit it for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it's so seeing your technique and how you do it is making me want to try again. Um, just because I had a bit more success with with the wet and dry patches, like you'd said. Um, it's fun because you get these little surprises, like I didn't see that coming. Exactly. Um, and then I tried um, I tried to outline my clouds a while, not that long ago, um, but it was very challenging as well. Where was it? Um, it was not that wrong. Sorry. Um, naturally now I can't oh yeah that's right because it was in another notebook okay forget that then um but I can also share that um that speaking of looking at botany I went and I had a little fun with grasses um on Sunday while I was out at the Balins with some friends and um as I as you can see I call myself a grassicist not a masochist, a grassicist. And I discovered something, um, the culmination of twenty of a 22-year grudge that's making it's made me the, the the culmination of yes. Yes, okay. Culmination. <laughs> um, so what had happened was long story short, 22 years ago, I was given a, a summer internship where we had to monitor a field of dead non-native annual grasses, land point transect monitoring, which means that every blade of grass that touches the flag you have to identify. Now, considering that a lot of them were missing their seed heads, try to imagine identifying a grass without their seed heads. We're told that we had to do it by ligule and oracle. I struggled, which is why I wanted to learn my grasses. Well, um, on this day, I, um, somebody else wanted to, me to explain a bit more about ligules and oracles, so I happened to grab another um, uh, blade of 
grass, uh, this one, and it was an older specimen. And I noticed that the parts that were so fresh that I'd seen on a newer specimen had shriveled up. And in the case of the ligule was almost completely gone. And, um, and so I couldn't show them the parts on the older specimens. And I'm thinking, but wasn't I supposed to identify that whole field of dead grasses? Mm. How am I supposed to identify that field of dead grasses when the, when the diagnostic parts are all shriveled up and difficult to tell? And I'm like, vindication. So now, I, now I'm just like, <laughs> why, should, why didn't they do it in the spring? They should have, they should have monitored this in the spring. And yeah. so I just feel very vindicated after 22 years. <laughs> what were they thinking in summer 2001? Yeah. <laughs> What were they thinking? Like, exclamation point, exclamation point. Big, bold question mark. Yeah. That I, I hold really, the and, and, and so, yeah, to, to, it's, it's one thing to kind of get what a, um, what a, a flower looks like in different states. Like, here's its bud, and everybody's like, yeah, here's the flower, here's the fruit. And everybody's doing that, but you're doing it with a grass stem, which is next level. Thank you. That is uh, the, the, the grassicism. Thank you. And then um, I'll share one last quick thing. I'll be very fast because I see, I see hands. So I just wanted to say that you'll be proud of me, Jack, because I'm becoming a bit more of a birder. Um, now, mind you, I have to double check all of this information against what might actually be occurring because I use, I use Merlin ID sound to capture the bird calls. And so I need to check. That's why I have question marks next to some of them to say, oh, did I really see this bird? But there was a particular day I saw like 27 total or rather um, Merlin captured 27 bird songs at my site. Um, and then I made colored dots to say which parts, which mini sites at my site. Um, we captured these songs so that then... I can do some, uh, especially because some of them were underneath trees and some of them weren't. So now I can compare them at some point to each other. And it gave me questions about, you know, why can I hear birds more clearly um, under the trees? Is it because they like the trees more? Is it because it's better acoustics? You get the idea. So I've got more questions and more exciting things um, to this look is a for. Great ch question, Shane. And also this uh, on, the, on the, the first page, this kind of dear data moment that you've got. You, you've got, do you know the book Dear Data? I just got it recently. Uh, the, the, you're, you're totally uh, inventing a new way of recording data. And I, so I love this, this, this thing with these little dots with different colors for each site as a way of recording that information. That's fun. Thank you, That's I fun. promise. I'll be, I'll make you proud yet. I'll become a fledgling birder and, and follow in your footsteps. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, okay, that's great. That's really fun. Thank you. Um, Sarah, um, I'm going to ask you to unmute before I bring you on now. Pow, there you are. Andrew, <laughs> how about that? Hi, um, I am going to, um, try to go out of the background here. There we go. Um, so I can share my page. Um, so I'm just completing um, the California Naturalist program again. Um, so I actually presented my capstone project last night. And tonight we've got some more people pre um, presenting. But what I decided to do for this class, um, partly because in celebration, partly of you, John, because um, I first learned journaling in 2017 when I took the class the first time. And I got the how to nature journal book and taught myself how to draw. And that was the beginning of this. So I gave myself permission to start a brand new sketchbook for this class specifically. I like to decorate with stickers on the front so that I know which is the front and which is the back. And I've been not only um, sketch journaling the classes, but also for our sit spots. So each week our instructor has given us instructions on what to do in our sit spot. And for me, my sit spot was my backyard. So the first week I did the map of my sit spot, um, which, whoops, let me back it up just a little bit. I and love the O on your spot. I, I started to do um, a bird list and then the birds kept coming and kept coming so I had to expand my bird list 
And this is a map that shows the northeast, south, and west of my sit spot, which is what her instructions were. That was, um, it was fun to be able to, to draw this out. And then um, a couple weeks into it, it was the question of um, going to one specific spot. So this is my east ver version of what I was seeing, which was a lot of goldfinches. And I was really proud of how these came out. Um, and I got poses on the bird feeder. Yes, then, yes. Um, oh, this is wonderful. Then um, we had a sense sit spot. So this one is about sense meditation. And I did um, what I was hearing, what I was smelling, and what I was seeing. So this is, again, the same sit spot and map, um, the bird list, some of the things I was smelling up here. Um, and I was actually drawing out where I was hearing the different sounds and mapped them. And then- And, and I like, uh, you, you've taken, I've, I've always seen NIMBY before, the not in my backyard, but you've got- Oh, I use, yeah, I use- it. You've got the in my backyard. Yep, yeah, in my own backyard. This was about soil in our sit spot. So this one is, um, was really a fun dive for me, kind of literally, because we didn't know what was underneath the gravel in our yard. The previous homeowner had laid down about four inches of gravel and so I just went out there and stuck a shovel in and said what is down there and this is what I came up with I still have my samples in some empty prescription bottles because I want to take a deeper dive into the actual elements of each one but I mapped them out according to color and then what the description was and some questions that I had about it and the exciting thing is I found soil and it drains super duper fast. So now I've got some more ideas about what I can plant back there. Go back to that, because there's all these ways of thinking on this page. We've got these, yes. um, I, I love how you're, you're getting these different soil horizons in this cross section, the little block diagram for the big picture over there, zoomed out in this um, overhead view map. You then got, um, uh, you're kind of uh, kind of coding things. There's so much thinking yeah. visible here. This is so much fun. It, it was great. And this other page that you can kind of see is um, actually kind of copying from our textbook. But I wanted to really draw it out so it would stay in my head about these different ways that water is termed and how it looks in the landscape. So that was that was really fun. But I want to share another on my sit spot. Um, so then um, for the first week in April, it was what's changing in our sit spot. And this was rather fun for me too, because I looked at some of the plants that were coming up through the gravel and um, really studied them rather than just looking at them and admiring them. Um, and I did that, I notice, I wonder, um, and my bird list. And yep. finally, I have one more I want to share. This one's really this cool. Is, this is and this is, this is a delight. This is, <laughs> this is partly thanks to Roseanne that I had to do a page that actually folds down um, because I had so much information I wanted to get on this spread. And this is my sit spot again. And I'm going to stand up so I can point to this right. Um, so this is the map of the sit spot, my backyard. And I identified A through P of different spots on the map. And then I defined those here and what they, what they are in that map. And then all the species of birds that I heard or saw during, a, it was supposed to be a 10 minute or 20 minute sit spot and mine turned into 90 minutes because I was so distracted by all of the species in my yard. And I wrote down what I was seeing and what the birds were doing and referred to them, whoops, as like in this one, the doves, what section of the map by the letters and what they were doing and went through each species about what they were doing when I was out there. And it turned into this whole oh. huge two page spread. And then I also did a zone map of what parts of the zones they were in, like in the top of the trees or in the mid, um, section of the yard or down in the lower bushes or even on the ground or in the feeders. I have bird feeders and 
bird baths. This is wonderful. It was really fun. So I really had a blast doing this and um, and just playing with different techniques and different styles of page layout. And um, and then we, we've been all over the place with our classes and our field trips. So it's nowhere near done. <laughs> I wanna go back and play with it some more, but it's been really fun and it's it's solidified stuff in here. And um, I've been explaining that to my fellow students and referring back to you, Jack, a lot about that and about how getting it down on paper puts it in here and keeps it in here really well. Yeah. Um, and Joseph Grinnell would not have been Joseph Grinnell without those journals. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the journal allows your brain to just hold so much more. And what I, I really want to point out to everybody, and I want to actually hear everybody who's watching, here's your challenge for this week, is we've seen here a bunch of different layouts and ways of kind of coding things or thinking about things. And um, that allows you to observe or quantify um, in ways that um, otherwise would be really, really difficult. And by using these, uh, using kind of an, an, an unusual kind of like code system, it's fun to get just to kind of geek out and develop that, but then you're going to find that that just sucks you down a rabbit hole. Uh -huh. that, that is, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's been really fun. And um, if anybody doesn't know about like the California Naturalist program here in, in our state, the curriculum is generally the same. The textbook is the same, no matter what agency you take it from, but each agency has a different focus. And that's why I'm taking it again, because the agency I'm taking it from right now is called Stewards of the Coast and Redwoods. And they operate um, Armstrong Redwood State Reserve, which is um, old growth redwoods, but they also manage parks all along our Pacific coast um, in our county. County. And so they, they do things like tide pool studies, uh, whale watch, seal watch, um, walks and tours in the forest and out on our coastal prairie. And the instructors are simply amazing. One of them is a master tracker who not only engages with our local tribes in learning about tracking. Yes, that's the handbook. Um, but she also is in touch with tribes across the whole North America and in Africa and has learned how to track katydids in Africa. Katydids. <laughs> they leave footprints and they um, oviposit in the sand. And she learned that from, I think it was a Maasai master tracker. And it's, it just blows my mind. She's just amazing. So it's a really, really neat program. My dream program is up at the Sierra Field Campus at um, Say Chen Creek. I'd love to take that course, but that's a, a dream. A, a tracking course there? Um, no, the um, California Naturalist class, because I oh. love I love Say Chen yeah, Creek. And they, and they, they do it in a, in a week, right? Just um, I think that one is an intensive, so it's like a five to eight day intensive, whereas yeah. this one I've been taking is an eight week. We meet once a week and then we have field trips. Yeah. It's it's a blast. It, it's fun. You also you get out there with a critical mass of, 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 of other people who are just really enjoying geeking out on these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, great groups of people. Anyway, I wanted to share about the sit spot thing because it's something that everybody can do. Everybody can find a sit spot. One of the ladies in the class lives in San Francisco, down in, in town. And she said, well, I don't have nature. I don't have a backyard. She's discovered so much by going out on her deck on the, like on a third story or whatever it is. And w like I told her, look at the sky, see what's going on in the sky. And she started, her brain has been exploding with all these things that she's seeing now. And it's really fun. Yeah. And, and, uh, you, you have uh, just nerd sniped Susan Becker. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I Well, you're fine. Susan's finding a lot of citizen science, which is yes. the way we learn. Um, and I don't know if other states have them. Mary Larson and I have been in contact about um, a naturalist program that she's involved with in her state. Um, but it's yeah, it's something to look into. It's run. This one's run by the California Academy of Sciences, 
um, and is also stewarded by University of California at Davis. So the uni university programs, I think, are the ones who are really putting these together. That's great. Yeah. So yeah, there we so go. Did you find a master naturalist program in your area? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thanks. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Really inspiring. Like the, the, the journal can change the way you see, can change the way you think. This is wonderful. Yes. Yes. And thank you for doing the clouds today. I appreciate that. I realize that I really just need to practice and stop trying to be a perfectionist about trying to get the cloud shapes just right. But that really helped. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, and uh, we're going to visit one more friend today. Uh, oh, no, two more friends. Um, let's see. Um, we're, we've got Sarah and, uh, and, and Cheryl, um, and there we go. Um, let's see, uh, who wants to go first? Well, let's, let's do, let's do Cheryl first here. Um, hey there, Cheryl. It's great to see you. Hey, sorry. I've had my camera off. I turned off at the beginning cause I'm moving around. I don't want to make people sick. And then I just I forget. That. Uh, just, gosh, John, so amazing. And everyone, your journal sharing, uh, so inspiring. I've got to get out and, and do it. Um, I just wanted to mention something I kind of was having fun and trying to discover. I found the guac incredibly challenging. Um, I played with watercolor a lot, but in my um, preferred plein air or whatever, I've done oil. So not messing around is really hard for me, but I quickly see it is impossible. You cannot with the gouache mess around. It's just unforgiving. It's, it's like, oh oh, no, you didn't. I, I, it was hard, but what I found is I let it dry. Um, something I wanted to mention, I know with the whole field journaling, the idea you have to be light and not carry tons of brushes or types, but I, I was just, I have, I'm home, so I've got this stuff in front of me and I need to work with the water brush I want to, but I also find that incredibly hard. It's just, I got to practice with it, but I, um, picked up a, uh, I was having trouble with the water brush trying to lift water off because it's nylon right it's not absorbing the water so i just had picked up a natural bristle brush to dab up the water finding that that actually if it's a really dry brush like just a cheap you could take a i pick these up at a place called scrap here which is used stuff people donate and um you know you could actually take the ferrule off of an old used brush or a cheap brush and have a super small brush to have a little bit of selection in the field box with maybe some natural bristle or or these are big but you can get the tiny bris chip brushes from the hardware store and you could cut the, off the handle you know saw it off or something and have these little almost makeup sized brushes that you could i found uh, i don't know if i could switch this camera and you could see it this is so tiny in the, um, I'm really technically challenged. I'm not seeing how to switch my um, phone around. So I'm just gonna flip it. Um, <clears throat> is that showing? Yeah, so I think yeah. it might be sideways, but wait, I'm trying to get this one. <sighs> the it's point is that side. little one in the square, using the dried brush, pulling down some of that paint. I just was trying to absorb the water, but it was, then you got these like in an, in an Indian miniature. I got like each little bristle was so dry. It was just dragging down a little of the gouache. And I love that, you know, and I, I realized you could play with that with, um, sorry, I'm too close. I speaking of a zombie, I could play with, uh, you know, making the rain of a cloud in the distance or something with those little tiny dried bristles pulling down the white gouache and stuff like that. And then the other uh, thing I yeah. bit was I tried to Signo um, Uniball, this, what's it called? Yeah, Signo White pen on top of the gouache because it's late, it's running out of time and it's got no definition and I didn't want to go back and re-wet the paper. This is not watercolor paper, it's getting difficult. So I just scribbled with the white Uniball, you know, over some of that and that was really fun and it you know because oh, it, yeah. right? it doesn't have to be perfect it's just about 
uh, entertaining myself really, right? And getting the essence of a, of a cloud in the color and the light. How can I do that if time's running out? The paper is already not gonna take more water. So, you know, you've introduced me to these tools and then in these workshops, this is what, only why I have them. Um, well, I, I, and that's, a, that's a great, um, I, I love how you're, 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 you're innovating and playing with that on that. Yes. So appreciate all the um, ideas and tools from you, of course, and, and, and Yeva and everyone who shares. So inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really great ideas. Glad you enjoyed that. And thank you for sharing those, 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 those tips. Um, so before we wrap, um, we're going to bounce over to, I think, Sarah. Uh, I think that was Sarah Reed who, who we got to hear from. Oh, we already yes. heard from Sarah. Okay, we're good. We're good. Um, did, was there somebody else? Are we? I think that's it. I'm going to go bounce off and teach this class. It should be fun today. Um, and um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming here. And um, uh, just like uh, Cheryl was saying, seeing everybody's tips and ideas and ways that people are approaching things just really, really inspiring. Getting to look inside other people's journals and kind of look inside other people's brains and see the way you think. That's really fun. I'm going to bring on the mad botanist again here. Uh, boom. And there's our brain. Yeah, getting to look at everybody's brain. That, the, 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 the journal is your brain on paper. And it just, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful mind and play with it and, and, and share that. <laughs> exactly. Um, hey, Avea, thank you so much for uh, helping facilitate and, and wrangle this. Uh, this this meeting. It's great to see you again. It's great to see you too, and thank you for bringing us together and for and for helping us all develop our nature journaling practice and fall more deeply in love with with our beautiful planet. We'll be hopefully using your skills on Earth Day. We we will we will. Oh, so if you folks um, again, if anybody's in the Bay Area, I uh, want to encourage you to come on out and uh, join us out um, at uh, Seal Point. And uh, we'll be uh, we'll be doing a little bit of a cleanup. Um, uh, Avea and I will both be there. Um, we're going to be wearing some grubby, muddy clothes that we can actually go out into the bay to rescue tires and things that might have rolled in there, which would be fun. Come on out and play, and then we'll eat some food, and then we'll go check out what's up with Daniel Smith, and um, it'll be a lot of fun. Looking forward to seeing you there. Looking forward to seeing everybody else there. If you're not going to be there, we can make a difference in other places. Um, just go find some place where you want to go journaling. And just when you when you leave, have made it a little bit of a better place than it was when you got there. And no matter where in the world you are, we'll be thinking of you. That's right. You. We'll be together. Thank you all. Be well, be kind, stay curious, and keep that journal at, the, at your fingertips. Bye-bye.